Welcome to the next installment in my lecture series for the Principles of Microeconomics course here at Rutgers University. And what I'm going to do in this lecture is to go over a couple of concepts here. Uh, notably, as obviously as it has on the screen here, we're going to take a look at total product, marginal product, and the average product of labor. So realize that it's very important to understand the relationship between these three. So as you can see here, I have a little table put up that gives you the units of labor here and your total output. When you graph out the units of labor and total output, that is giving you your total product curve. What it's telling you is that for each unit of labor that you have, how much output should you produce given that. So if we just take a look quickly at these numbers, you can see that obviously if I don't have any workers, I'm producing nothing. I hire one worker and I'm producing an output of 50. I hire a second worker, my output goes to 120. I hire a third worker, 200, and so on. So it's just relating the input of labor to the, the output that we have. So if I actually graph that information out, this is what we get. This is what the total product of, la of labor curve looks like. And I want you to remember this shape here. It's important to realize, number one, if you take a look at this, you can see that the total product of labor curve uh, is increasing all the way through. But one of the things that you should notice, too, at this beginning part is that the slope of this line is getting greater. This is getting steeper and steeper at the beginning part of the curve. Then we get to a point where the uh, total product of labor curve is still increasing, but that's the slope is actually declining. So the slope here past uh, an output of three, the slope is getting smaller and smaller. It's still positive, but the numbers are getting smaller and smaller. And then I also want you to realize at a point that the total product of the labor curve actually starts to decrease, that once you hire past a certain point, your output will actually start to decline. Uh, the rationale for this is due to the fact that you might, you might have a limited amount of space that you're hiring, um, that you have people available for people to work in, and you just might have too many people working for you. They're getting in each other's way. Things are actually getting destroyed instead of being created. So... If we take a look at this, and let me actually make that so you can say it, is that you should realize that, that there are, are three distinct sections of the uh, total product of labor curve that I want you to be aware of. This part in the beginning here, where we have an increasing slope. So the slope is positive here at the beginning, and, but the slope is increasing. It's getting steeper and steeper. Then we have a section section here, in our example, between uh, three workers and six workers, where the slope is still positive, but the slope itself is decreasing. That means that the, as we're hiring more workers, the increase in our output is getting smaller and smaller. And then once we get past six, we actually see that the slope of this is negative, that the total product of labor curve is actually decreasing, that hiring an additional worker, hiring the seventh worker, for example, actually decreases our output. So I want you to realize that, that if you graph out the number of workers that you have with the output that you're producing with those with the number of workers that you have that is telling you the total product this is giving you what it's relating to you is the size of your labor force to what the levels of production you have for your particular company so that's just if I take this information here and graph out that information with units of labor on the x-axis and total output on the y-axis. Now one of the things we're going to be concerned with is if I give you that information you should be able to calculate the marginal product of labor and the average product of labor. All right and down here I've given you the formulas. Here's the marginal product of labor. It's the change in Q divided by the change in L. So basically what we're looking at is as I hire an additional worker how much does my output increase? So let's take a look at it here for these initial uh, units of labor. If I have no workers, I produce nothing. I hire one worker. My output goes from 0 to 50. Therefore, my marginal product of labor is equal to 50. 
and I didn't format that so well, so let me fix the formatting on that. I believe over these 16 and centered, all right. 16 and centered. Oh, should be 16, not 18. Apologies for that. And again, all right. <clears throat> Again, apologies for that, my formatting errors here. So let's take a look at what happens when we go from one worker to two workers. When we have one worker, we're producing 50 units. We hire a second worker, our output jumps to 120. That's an increase of 70 units of output. Let's do that for when we go from two workers to three workers. Our output when we have two workers is equal to 120. We hire a third worker, our output jumps to 200. Marginal product of labor is equal to 80. I'll do that uh, one more time for you. When we have three workers, our output's equal to 200. I hire a fourth worker, my output increases to 250. Therefore, by hiring that worker, that fourth worker, my output has jumped by 50 units. So I'll just fill this out for the remainder of these. And as you can see at the end, our output has actually turned negative. All right, so we have filled in the marginal product of labor column here with that information. So make sure you're comfortable with calculating the marginal product of labor when I give you uh, the total product curve, the units of labor and the total output that's being produced at those different levels of uh, hiring at the number of workers that I have. Well, let me bring up a, another table. Let me graph out what the marginal product of labor curve looks like. So if I bring that up, there you have your marginal product of labor curve. All I did was take that data that we got and that showed the units of labor and the marginal product of labor. So you can see that this basically relates to, and it is, it relates to the slope of the total product of labor curve. Remember I told you at the beginning of this that the total uh, product of labor uh, was getting steeper. Here we can see that the marginal product of labor is increasing up until 3. Then we see it's actually decreasing from 3 to 6. And then if I had continued this out for the seventh one, we would have seen this number was negative. So make sure you understand, number one, what the total product of labor curve looks like and what's the implication for the marginal product of labor curve. All right, and let's calculate the average product of labor. Let me bring up the average product of labor, the APL, is just Q divided by L. So I would just be taking this column here and dividing by that column. So Q divided by L is the average product of labor. All right. And so if I do 50 divided by 1, I get 50. If I do 120 divided by 2, it's equal to 60. If I do 200 divided by 3, that's equal to 66.67. If I do 250 divided by 4, that equals to 62.5. And I have my calculator out. You might be hearing it clicking in the background. So 270 divided by 5. 270 divided by 5 equals 54. 280 divided by 6 equals 46.67. And 260 divided by 7 equals 37.14. So there we have the marginal product of labor. So make sure you remember number one, uh, what total product of labor curve represents. And also, if I give you the data behind the total product of labor curve, that you can calculate the average product of labor and the marginal product of labor. Marginal product of labor is just a change in Q divided by the change in L, and the average product of labor is just Q divided by L. So I filled in that information here. 
let me bring up what the average product of labor curve looks like. So your average product of labor looks like this. At the beginning stages, it's increasing. All right, so up until unit uh, three of labor, we see that the, total, the average product of labor curve is increasing. But past three, we see it starts to decline. So all we're doing is graphing out the average product of labor versus the total units of labor that we have. Interestingly, let's put the uh, marginal product of labor curve and the average product of labor curve. So we're going to map out and graph out the marginal product of labor and the average product of labor curve together to see the relationship. And you should see that there is a very distinct relationship here. You can see that whenever marginal product is greater than average product of labor, that that pulls average product of labor up. So when the marginal is greater than the average, the average increases. What do we see once that the marginal product of labor falls below the average product of labor curve? We see that when the marginal product of labor curve is below average product of labor, it starts to pull average product of labor down. So make sure you realize that, that whenever the marginal product is um, the marginal product of anything is greater than the average product. So if the marginal product of labor is greater than the average product of labor, it, it causes the average product of labor curve to increase. And then once the marginal product of labor falls below the average product of labor, it pulls the average product of labor curve down. All right. The example I give uh, for this sometimes is think instead of thinking about this as labor, think about your grade point average. All right. Let's say you have a grade point average of 3.0, and you decide to take a summer course, one course over the summer. And so let's analyze and take a look at the impact that that single course, that marginal grade, has on your grade point average. Let's assume. Uh, that you get an A in that summer course. If you get an A in that summer course, a 4.0, and your grade point average before you take that class is a 3.0, your grade point average is going to be pulled up. So if your grade in that marginal course, that one course you take in the summer, is greater than your grade point average, it pulls your grade point average up. Much the same as if the marginal product of labor was greater than the average product of labor. That pulls it up. Same thing happens if you're, you're get a, you take that summer course and your grade is below your uh, grade point average. For example, let's keep the example where your GPA is equal to a 3.0. You take a summer course and you get a C in that course. When that occurs, your grade point average falls. So the marginal grade of that summer course, since it's below your grade point average, pulls your grade point average down. So here's your average product of labor, your grade point average, and if you have a 3.0 and the class you take in the summer you get a C in, that pulls your grade point average down. So make sure that you're comfortable with this, this relationship between the marginal product of labor and the average product of labor. It's very important that you understand that. And on top of that, make sure you're comfortable if I give you, for example, this information here, and the remainder of this table is blank. If I delete this information out, all right, if I were to make this uh, let me see, edit, oh, I'll just cut it out. How about that? That would be the easiest thing to do. If I take that information, and cut that information out. If I give you this table here, if I give you the total product of labor curve, the data that includes the units of labor and your total output, you should be able to calculate the marginal product of, product of labor and the average product of labor. Uh, I hope this has been some help to you. Uh, as again, this is an important thing to understand because we're going to take a look at uh, decisions, firms, and maximizing profits, and having to understand, having an understanding about labor, because one of the things we're going to do is simplify this, is just, just assuming that labor is the only input that we can vary in the short run. So if you understand this relationship between total product, marginal product, and average product of labor, it's, it's very helpful, number one, in determining 
For example, should you hire more people or should you fire people? But also it reinforces that marginal concept that we talked about. Remember we said at the very beginning of the course that this economics is very much about marginalism and looking at marginal impacts, you know, marginal benefits, marginal costs, marginal revenue, etc. We're going to be continuing with this concept of making decisions on the margin. So this, the marginal product of labor, just reinforces the concept of understanding the analysis on the margin.